Sax Romer's The Insidious Dr. Fu Manchu, being a somewhat detailed account of the amazing adventures of Nayland Smith in his trailing the sinister Chinaman. Narrated by Edward E. French. Chapter 28. Of all that we had hoped for in our pursuit of Fu Manchu, how little we had accomplished! Excepting Karamani and her brother, who were victims and not creatures of the Chinese doctors, not one of the formidable group had fallen alive into our hands. Dreadful crimes had marked Fu Manchu's passage through the land. Not one half of the truth, and nothing of the later developments, had been made public. Nalan Smith's authority was sufficient to control the press. In the absence of such a veto, a veritable panic must have seized upon the entire country, for a monster, a thing more than humanly evil, existed in our midst. Always Fu Manchu's secret activities had centered about the great waterway. There was much of poetic justice in his end, for the Thames had claimed him, who so long had used the stream as a highway for the passage to and fro his secret forces. Gone now were the yellow men who had been the instruments of his evil will. Gone was the giant intellect which had controlled the complex murder machine. Karamani, whose beauty he had used as a lure, at last was free, and no more with her smile would tempt men to death, that her brother might live. Many there are, I doubt not, who will regard the eastern girl with horror. I ask their forgiveness, in that I regarded her quite differently. No man, having seen her, could have condemned her unheard. Many, having looked into her lovely eyes, had they found there what I found, must have forgiven her almost any crime. That she valued human life but little was no matter for wonder. Her nationality, her history, furnished adequate excuse for an attitude not condonable in a European equally cultured. But indeed, let me confess that hers was a nature incomprehensible to me in some respects. The soul of Karamani was a closed book to my short-sighted western eyes. But the body of Karamani was exquisite, a beauty of a kind that was a key to the most extravagant rhapsodies of eastern poets. Her eyes held a challenge wholly oriental in its appeal. Her lips, even in repose, were a taunt. And herein east is west, and west is east. Finally, despite her lurid history, despite the scornful self-possession of which I knew her capable, she was an unprotected girl, in years, I believe, a mere child, whom fate had cast in my way. At her request we had booked passages for her brother and herself to Egypt. The boat sailed in three days. But Karamani's beautiful eyes were sad. Often I detected tears on the black lashes. Shall I endeavor to describe my own tumultuous, conflicting emotions? It would be useless, since I know it to be impossible. For in those dark eyes burned a fire I might not see. Those silken lashes veiled a message I dared not read. Nayland Smith was not blind to the facts of the complicated situation. I can truthfully assert that he was the only man of my acquaintance who, having come in contact with Karamani, had kept his head. We endeavored to divert her mind from the recent tragedies by a round of amusements. Though with poor Weymouth's body still at the mercy of unknown waters, Smith and I made but a poor show of gaiety and I took a gloomy pride in the admiration which our lovely companion everywhere excited. I learned in those days how rare a thing in nature is a really beautiful woman. One afternoon we found ourselves at an exhibition of watercolors in Bond Street. Karamani was intensely interested in the subjects of the drawings, which were entirely Egyptian. As usual, she furnished matter for comment amongst the other visitors, as did the boy, Aziz, her brother, anew upon the world from his living grave in the house of Dr. Fu Manchu. Suddenly, Aziz clutched at his sister's arm, whispering rapidly in Arabic. I saw her peach-like color fade, saw her become pale and wild-eyed. 
the haunted Karamani of the old days. She turned to me. Dr. Petri, he says that Fu Manchu is here. Where? Nayland Smith rapped out the question violently, turning in a flash from the picture which he was examining. In this room, she whispered, glancing furtively, affrightedly about her. Something tells us ease when he is near, and I too feel strangely afraid. Oh, can it be that he is not dead? She held my arm tightly. Her brother was searching the room with big velvet black eyes. I studied the faces of several visitors, and Smith was staring about him with the old alert look and tugging nervously at the lobe of his ear. The name of the giant foe of the white race instantaneously had strung him up to a pitch of supreme intensity. Our united scrutinies discovered no figure which could have been that of the Chinese doctor. Who could mistake that long, gaunt shape with the high, mummy-like shoulders and the indescribable gait which I can only liken to that of an awkward cat? Then, over the heads of a group of people who stood by the doorway, I saw Smith peering at someone, at someone who passed along the outer room. Stepping aside, I too obtained a glimpse of this person. As I saw him, he was a tall old man wearing a black Inverness coat and a rather shabby silk hat. He had long white hair and a patriarchal beard, wore smoked glasses and walked slowly, leaning upon a stick. Smith's gaunt face paled. With a rapid glance at Karamani, he made off across the room. Could it be Dr. Fu Manchu? Many days had passed since, already half choked by Inspector Weymouth's iron grip, Fu Manchu, before our own eyes, had been swallowed up by the Thames. Even now men were seeking his body and that of his last victim. Nor had we left any stone unturned. Acting upon information furnished by Karamani, the police had searched every known haunt of the murder group, but everything pointed to the fact that the group was disbanded and dispersed, that the lord of strange deaths who had ruled it was no more. Yet Smith was not satisfied, neither, let me confess, was I. Every port was watched, and in the suspected districts a kind of house-to-house -house patrol had been instituted, unknown to the great public. In those days a secret war raged, a war in which all available forces of the authorities took the field against one man. But that one man was the evil of the East incarnate. When we rejoined him, Nayland Smith was talking to the commissioner at the door. He turned to me. That is Professor General Munda, he said. The sergeant here knows him well. The name of the celebrated Orientalist, of course, was familiar to me, although I had never before set eyes upon him. The professor was out east the last time I was there, sir, stated the commissioner. I often used to see him, but he's an eccentric old gentleman, seems to live in a world of his own. He's recently back from China, I think. Nayland Smith stood clicking his teeth together in irritable hesitation. I heard Karamani sigh, and, looking at her, I saw that her cheeks were regaining their natural color. She smiled in pathetic apology. "'If he was here, he is gone,' she said. "'I am not afraid now.' Smith thanked the commissioner for his information, and we quitted the gallery. "'Professor Jenner Munde muttered my friend, has lived so long in China as almost to be a Chinaman. I've never met him, never seen him before, but I wonder. You wonder what, Smith? I wonder if he could possibly be an ally of the doctors. I stared at him in amazement. If we are to attach any importance to the incident at all, I said, we must remember that the boy's impression, and Karamani's, was that Fu Manchu was present in person. I do attach importance to the incident, Petri. They are naturally sensitive to such impressions, but I doubt if even the abnormal organization of Aziz could distinguish between the hidden presence of a creature of the doctors and that of the doctor himself. I shall make a point of calling upon Professor Jenner Munde. But fate had ordained that much should happen ere Smith made his proposed call upon the professor. 
Garamani and her brother, safely lodged in their hotel, which was watched day and night by four men under Smith's orders, we would return to my quiet suburban rooms. First, said Smith, let us see what we can find out respecting Professor Munde. He went to the telephone and called up New Scotland Yard. There followed some little delay before the requisite information was obtained. Finally, however, we learned that the professor was something of a recluse, having few acquaintances and fewer friends. He lived alone in chambers in New Court, Carey Street. A charwoman did such cleaning as was considered necessary by the professor, who employed no regular domestic. When he was in London, he might be seen fairly frequently at the British Museum, where his shabby figure was familiar to the officials. When he was not in London, that is, during the greater part of each year, no one knew where he went. He never left any address to which letters might be forwarded. How long has he been in London now? asked Smith. So far as could be ascertained from New Inn Court, replied Scotland Yard, roughly a week. My friend left the telephone and began restlessly to pace the room. The charred briar was produced and stuffed with that broad-cut Latakia mixture, of which Nayland Smith consumed close upon a pound a week. He was one of those untidy smokers who leave tangled tufts hanging from the pipe bowl, and when they light up, strew the floor with smouldering fragments. A ringing came, and shortly afterwards a girl entered. Mr. James Weymouth, to see you, sir. Hello, rapped Smith. What's this? Weymouth entered, big and florid, and in some respects singularly like his brother, in others as singularly unlike. Now, in his black suit, he was a somber figure, and in the blue eyes I read a fear suppressed. Mr. Smith, he began, there's something uncanny going on at Maple Cottage. Smith wheeled the big armchair forward. Sit down, Mr. Weymouth, he said. I'm not entirely surprised. But you have my attention. What has occurred? Weymouth took a cigarette from the box which I proffered and poured out a peg of whiskey. His hand was not quite steady. That knocking, he explained it. It came again the night after you were there. And Mrs. Weymouth, my wife, I mean, felt that she couldn't spend another night there alone. Did she look out of the window? I asked. No, Doctor, she was afraid, but I spent last night downstairs in the sitting-room, and, and uh, I looked out. He took a gulp from his glass. Nayland Smith, seated on the edge of the table, his extinguished pipe in his hand, was watching him keenly. I'll admit oh, I didn't look out at once, Weymouth resumed. There was something so uncanny and gentleman in that knocking, knocking in the dead of the night. I thought his voice shook of poor Jack lying somewhere amongst the slime of the river, and, oh, my God, it, it came to me that it, it was Jack who was knocking, and I dare not think what he, what it, would look like. He leaned forward, his chin in his hand. For a few moments we were all silent. I know I thunked, he continued huskily, but when the wife came to the head of the stairs and whispered to me, There it is again. What in heaven's name can it be? I started to unbolt the door. The knocking had stopped. Everything was very still. I heard Mary, his widow, sobbing upstairs. That was all. I opened the door. A little bit at a time. Pausing again, he cleared his throat and went on. It was a bright night and there was no one there. Not a soul. But somewhere down the lane, as I looked out into the porch, I heard the most awful groans. They got fainter and fainter. Then I could have sworn I heard someone laughing. My nerves cracked up after that, and I shut the door again. The narration of his weird experience revived something of the natural fear which it had occasioned. He raised his glass with an unsteady hand and drained it. Smith struck a match and relighted his pipe. He began to pace the room again. 
His eyes were literally on fire. Would it be possible to get Mrs. Weymouth out of the house before tonight? Remove her to your place, for instance, he asked abruptly. Weymouth looked up in surprise. She seems to be in a very low state, he replied. He glanced at me. Perhaps Dr. Petrie would give us an opinion. I will come and see her, I said. But what is your idea, Smith? I want to hear that knocking, he rapped. But in what I may see fit to do, I must not be handicapped by the presence of a sick woman. Her condition at any rate will admit of our administering an opiate, I suggested. That would meet the situation? Good, cried Smith. He was intensely excited now. I rely upon you to arrange something, Petrie. Mr. Weymouth, he turned to our visitor, I shall be with you this evening not later than twelve o'clock. Weymouth appeared to be greatly relieved. I asked him to wait whilst I prepared a draught for the patient. When he was gone, What do you think this knocking means, Smith? I asked. He tapped out his pipe on the side of the grate and began with nervous energy to refill it again from the dilapidated pouch. I dare not tell you what I hope, Petrie, he replied. Nor what I fear, 